Hello, how are you? I'm fine. This time I'm talking about how the marketing industry is hungrily flipping YouTubers, Instagrammers, TikTokers, Snapchatters, and so on, into salespeople. How influencer marketing is full of deception, bots, and dodgy data. And how the influencer bubble is, in my opinion, set to inflate and deflate like some old bagpipes, slowly shitting themselves to death. I am tired and don't really want to do this, but I don't like saying no to a signed check, so let's just jump in. No. <laughs> As I've noted before, they are not just a sponsor, they are a service I personally love. I know what you're thinking, mums and dads. What the hell is an influencer? Well, an influencer is anyone or anything that can influence others' product buying decisions. But really, the way it's used now, an influencer is someone with an online following who they hawk products to. It's one of those marketing words that is as definable as you'd expect from paradigm shifters. J.K. Simmons is a very famous actor, but even though he sells farmers insurance on ads, he's not an influencer. He's too famous to be an influencer. An influencer is someone who occupies anywhere from nothing to a large online following, but not someone necessarily with a monetizable talent. Maybe they're not an artist, not a sporter, not an expert, not really a personality, but they are sort of famous and willing to take sponsorships. They might make videos or posts where sponsors are mentioned, or they might post something that is purely a sponsored message. You could be very famous and influential, but not really be an influencer if you're not selling a sponsored product. This is all marketing speak after all. Simply, an influencer is someone who does this. Which provides protection for up to a year. Can you imagine going a year or 20,000 miles in between oil changes? Influencer marketing as we know it now emerged with the mass adoption of the internet. Popular bloggers with a readership that trusted them would be paid by brands to plug products. This person has a cooking blog, so mention the domestic argas, why not? That sort of thing. Then, with the rise of social media, the practice began to expand, and the influencer marketing industry went from being worth $500 million in 2015 to $1.7 billion in 2016, and to around $10 billion in 2020. According to a 2021 survey of 5,000 marketing agencies and brands, 75% now have dedicated budgets for influencer marketing, with Instagram as the top platform of choice for 67% of them. Yes, insincerely reciting an advertisement for a product directly into camera, whilst pretending that you're not doing it for the compensation, but rather out of unhinged joy, is big business. Buy Mr. Brain's pork faggots. I'm paid to say this, but I mean it. I would certainly choose to eat them again. If you're busy like me, going to the video store is a hassle. The speed of the influencer marketing industry's growth had a lot to do with the changing media consumption habits of consumers. Netflix began its streaming service in 2007, and the 2010s saw cable subscriber numbers steadily shrink. In 2015, 76% of American adults had cable television in their homes, and in 2021, that number had decreased to 56%. In the late 2010s, the time Americans spent looking at their phones began to overtake the time they spent looking at their TVs. Added to that are numerous services to pause live TV and skip ads, and it becomes clear why the number of people who see television commercials has been on the decline for years. As the audience share shifted to mobile, ads followed. Although they feel like they're everywhere, 
they don't have the same reach that unskippable TV ads once had, where you either had to watch six 30 second commercials in a row, or mute the TV and listen to the plumbing for three minutes, five times an hour, or change the channel and hope that you're only gone long enough to miss the commercials, without missing your show because then you'll never know what happened and Happy Days will not make any more sense until you watch the reruns, and that might be ages away. As of 2021, about 42% of the world's internet users use an ad blocker, including about 27% of Americans, the juiciest market. Worse still for marketers is that these numbers are growing, and mostly so amongst the youngest demographics, the people that marketers are generally the most interested in. Influencers are, perhaps in theory, the ultimate answer to this. There are no apps that can skip the ads, because the ads are embedded directly into the script. Advertisers still use actual famous celebrities for marketing, but the trend has really turned toward non-celebrity influencers, because they have things like high engagement rates and audience interaction, both encouraging a more active viewership and offering relevant, quantifiable data. Really, advertisers had an easy time before the 2000s, with a captured audience glued to the TV screen. Since the internet started to become more popular, there's been a kind of arms race between advertisements and the attention of people who are constantly bombarded with them. I don't know anyone who doesn't press the skip button as soon as possible. Why wouldn't they? Why shouldn't they? So, they get people on screen to do the ads, but the arms race doesn't stop. Just saying buy beans, like a commercial, just becomes white noise too. This is the level-headed midi dress in the shade forest green. I also got this in brown. Industry literature now identifies the most valuable asset that influencers have as something that I think will lead to the unraveling of all of this. Feelings of authenticity. Influencers feel more attainable to consumers. Yes, cringeworthy aspirational elements are often at play, but the marketing value of influencers, and really the value of them to their audiences, is that they usually feel a lot more like someone you could just have a chat with. I like J.K. Simmons, but I know J.K. Simmons is just an actor, and probably really doesn't care one way or another about insurance. But this person, playing themselves maybe, feels like they're not acting, even like they're a friend. Feelings of authenticity are now considered very important in successful influencer marketing. A good influencer has to convincingly perform at being authentic in their brand endorsements. It's not good enough to just say the words, you have to act like you really love it. Like yeah, it's an ad, but you'd say this shit anyway. Skillshare has an online learning course for Instagram for business, which I'm very interested in exploring more and trying to grow and expand my business through Instagram. Get Crunchyroll now because it's freaking an amazing show. You've been watching it? For this reason, many brands are dropping strict ad requirements in favor of letting the influencer promote the product however they wish to make it feel more authentic. So, they no longer have as many stipulations about things like time code placement, number of times the website should be shown, things like that. They're trying to give influencers a bit more freedom so as to do away with the awkwardness that comes with, well, you know, shilling, and make it feel a bit more natural, somehow, hopefully, magically, please. Just like you might want to subscribe to our sponsor for today's video. But looking directly into camera, as eye to eye as you can be, and telling people, buy this product, it's brilliant, is not an authentic thing to do. I think some influencers will be able to get away with it over time if they're selective, but in my opinion, the more they try and fade ads into opinion and into actual content, the more alienating it will become. It's almost as if authenticity has no monetary value, because as soon as you use it to sell some tat, it evaporates. Of course, some audiences are more tolerant than others, and I think some clever influencers can successfully explain to their audience that they need the money. But it seems to me 
that ultimately the marketing is chasing people who increasingly do not want to look at marketing, in a way that is about as inauthentic as it gets. This is the visual conception of all of this. Now this is some dystopian shit. But it's not just that the pursuit of authenticity is surely self-defeating. The more I look at influencer marketing, the more it starts to look like a scam. But what's interesting is that it's sort of a group of people all scamming each other. Wow, 10,000 views for 24 bucks, and they take credit card. The average person working one of these click farms, there'll be one person for 200 phones. And a click farm might have hundreds, if not thousands of employees clicking at these things all day long. In 2019, an analysis from the Institute of Contemporary Music Performance determined that some of the biggest celebrities on Instagram have fake followers. Ellen DeGeneres, The Kardashians, and Taylor Swift were all examples of celebrities for whom more than 40% of their followers were determined to be fake. In fact, the number of fake accounts on social media has been a problem for advertisers for years. In 2017, a study from USC estimated that between 9 to 15% of Twitter accounts were bots, about 48 million accounts on the low end of the estimate. In 2020, Facebook alone reportedly deleted 4.5 billion accounts, equivalent to 60% of the world population. And this is where the whole thing gets really interesting. Along with the rise of influencers has come the rise of fake influencers. People who buy fake followers and fake engagement, then get marketing deals to capitalize on it. In 2019, a cybersecurity company called Check issued a report estimating that fake influencers cost advertisers $1.3 billion that year, about 15% of the total market. In the late 2010s, a marketing agency called Media Kicks did an experiment where they created two fake influencer accounts on Instagram. And the whole point of this entire project was to see if you buy a ton of fake followers, are you still going to be able to get brand deals? Are brands just looking at your follower count or are they really looking to see if they align with all of your values or actually think you're a good influencer? For the first account, they created a fashion and lifestyle influencer. They hired a model to pretend to be the influencer and did all the photography for the account in a one-day photo shoot. For the second account, they created a travel and photography influencer, and all of the photos on the account were just free stock photos of different locations around the world. Next, they began to purchase followers, starting with 1,000 followers per day, because they were afraid Instagram might detect a surge in followers as fraudulent activity, which it was. But they soon discovered that they could purchase up to 15,000 followers at once without encountering any issues. The pricing ranged from three to eight dollars per thousand followers. In the course of two months, they purchased 50,000 followers for the fashion account and 30,000 for the travel account. Next, they purchased fake engagement, about 12 cents per comment and four to nine dollars per thousand likes. Finally, they signed up for various influencer marketing platforms and began submitting applications for brand sponsorship. And it worked. They secured two brand sponsorship deals for each of the fake accounts, paid with monetary compensation, free products, or both. And they concluded that for a few hundred dollars investment, literally anyone can become a fake influencer and secure brand deals. You don't even have to take the photos yourself, you can just use stock. But of course you don't really need a fake influencer because there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people who want to be influencers apparently. Like crabs they are, like hermit crabs crawling over each other like in that documentary that I saw. A 2018 article in The Atlantic details how influencers have begun to fake having brand sponsorships in an effort to look more attractive to real brand sponsors. Many promote things for free, to look as though they have sponsorship or just to have some content to put out there, I guess. They might do this 
without the brand having any idea. In the United States, influencer marketing is seen by the Federal Trade Commission as a form of paid endorsement. And the package just goes more into detail on the product and how to share it on your social media. And I just thought it was super cute. Back in 2000, the FTC released its first set of guidelines for internet advertising, saying that paid endorsements must be disclosed to consumers to comply with truth in advertising standards. And it isn't just money they are concerned about. The FTC guidelines say that if there is any material connection between the brand and the influencer, it must be clearly disclosed. This includes influencers who receive free products rather than money, as well as influencers who have family connections to a business. These rules have been updated every few years, but until recently were flouted by influencers left and right. It wasn't until 2017 that the FTC really tried to crack down by sending out warnings to 90 celebrities, influencers, and brands that they determined were not complying. Some celebrities on the list didn't provide disclosures at all, whereas others would try to bury the disclosures, for example, putting hashtag partner or hashtag thanks brand at the end of a string of hashtags, and the FTC deems that insufficient as disclosure, and clearly it is. Hashtag corporate friend, but this didn't seem to have much effect. One of the celebrities who was warned by the FTC in 2017 was Diddy, previously known as Mr. Puff Daddy, of the Tonka Toy Fortune, who was warned about advertising for Ciroc Vodka without proper disclosure. I'm in a phase in my life, I'm gonna be honest, Ellen. I'm not doing any press. Mm -hmm. I'm shut out from the press. I came here to see my friend. Really? Yes. Oh. Within a week of the report coming out, almost all of the Ciroc ads mentioned including those posted by Big Diddy, were removed from Instagram. But no further action was taken by the FTC. They were caught and they stopped. And that's the sort of outcome you see again and again. It does, however, seem likely that in the future, the FTC will start to be felt more in US internetings for no other reason than that is where the spotlight is heading. Influencer marketing. European advertising legislators have been recently tightening regulations surrounding disclosure, with a number stressing the need for content to be labelled with advertisement and not any ambiguous word or phrase, like partner. Hashtag momboss, hashtag corporate friend. So the future of influencers selling stuff is probably going to include a verbal acknowledgement seamlessly blended in with an authentic ad by Beans that will be completely imperceptible but, by beans, within the rules. Still thinking about them beans. Which may have to be promoted via some vague, authentic, real, normal comments. Which translates directly into their unique design and stretchy laces that you only need to tie once and never again. So, do we measure return on investment by having customers get a discount code, or are we just pissing in the wind? According to the InfluencerMarketingHub.com survey, 33% of firms don't measure the ROI of influencer marketing at all, and yet about 90% of respondents also say that they believe influencer marketing is effective. I wonder how much of this comes to the marketing industry being very good at marketing the marketing industry. It seems to me that the use of influencers like this uh, will probably be part of a, a bubble that will get a bit larger and then quite a bit smaller, and that is connected to a perhaps larger marketing bubble uh, that has something to do with an unwillingness to accept that attrition of attention and disposable cash may actually be real. I think the more that influencer sponsorships become common, the less effective they will be, and that will ultimately lead to the ads moving kind of somewhere else. I'm a YouTuber. But before I was a YouTuber, I was a viewer. And as a viewer, I really didn't like it when people would take sponsorships and directly talk to me about a product. It always felt fake, it always felt gross, and I still feel the same way, even if it's becoming normal. 
I'm not saying you should feel like that or anything, but I do think there's quite a lot of people who probably feel similar to me. Uh, and I think those people will grow the more it becomes in your face. Or maybe not. I don't know. Here's a commercial. I'm thinking... Lincoln Casino Lottery. It's like dog food. Chum. I'm seeing chum. Or is it Jaws on next? Oh, remember that? When there was something next? When you were watching somebody else's playlist. Those are the days. I'm just talking while the, the cards are up, I guess. I guess. I could probably do this and then do a black screen and get 20 more seconds out of it. Juice that, YouTube Red, you fucker. I guess, I mean, it's pretty good actually for me, I guess. Thanks for that. Thanks, YouTube Red, you fucker. That should be enough. Oh, I guess I'm gonna go some good some pepperoni.